Today we're going over to the north of the island and we're going to have a look at the Lagan Cottage Loop. So we're going to see some Permian sedimentary sequences and have a look at Hutton's Unconformity in the Dalradian rocks. Check out the links in the description and above to see part one of this video. So we're continuing our transition from the marine carbonate environment of the Carboniferous up into the arid environments of the Permian and we can see that our sandstones and limestones are getting replaced by these red mudstones interbedded with sandstones that look like they've got a fluvial character. And you can see here where the grey sandstone on top is eroding down into these mudstone beds. So we've probably got these coastal rivers spilling out over coastal mud flats or mud plains. And because they're interbedded like this, we can say that we've probably got very rapid relative sea level changes happening in this area. Here's some rise accretions, which means that we had a land surface with plants growing on it. And the decay of those plants produce these carbonate nodules. We can see the transition here quite starkly between the grey and burgundy purple muds and fluvial sandstones and then these bright orange aeolian and fluvial arid sandstones. These ridges are infilled desiccation cracks so that tells us that this was an arid environment that underwent periods of intense evaporation and the sediment drying out. They're preserved like this because of microbial mats probably and unsurprisingly they're called bird foot cracks. The aeolian and fluvial sediments here have a slightly different character from the ones we saw on the other side of the island. We've got a lot more of these gravel beds interbedded with our cross-bedded sandstones. So we have a slightly different kind of arid environment here on the other side of the island during the Permian. And these gravel beds are full of quartz that's been eroded out of the underlying Dalradian rocks. And they have a kind of cyclicity to them. So that means whatever was happening was happening very regular. So what we think these are, are wadi deposits and that the gravels were deposited during flash floods. And we can say that because we can compare them to modern wadi deposits and they look pretty much the same. The sandstones in between the gravel beds represent periods of aeolian transport. So this is when we're getting our wind blown desert dunes in between the wet seasons. And those could have been standard wet seasons on an annual basis or they could have been uh, wetter in climates that were lasting for hundreds or thousands of years. We don't really know because we can't measure the rate of sedimentation. We can only guess based on observations of modern environments. But these environments were next to each other and they were changing frequently and that's why they're so interbedded closely together like this. And when these aeolian conditions dominated we had dune fields like we saw on the other side of the island. And that's why we get our honeycomb weathered sandstone again because there was nothing between the grains to cement them together it had all been blown away or washed away. And like on the other side of the island there's this thick interval here where aeolian conditions dominated. So we've got another dune field with all of these wonderful sand dunes preserved again and we can correlate that to the other side of the island and say these are probably about the same age. And we know that that in the Permian large areas of the British Isles and North Sea were covered by these sand dunes because there's a huge desert covering central Pangaea. You can normally see the dunes and fluvial sediments in this wonderful cliff section here um, but the light was in the wrong direction so you can't really see them here which is a shame. On the subject of time here's one of Hutton's many unconformities. On the top you've got these gently dipping carboniferous sediments and underneath them you've got these steeply dipping Dalradian metamorphic rocks. And Hutton had watched the rates of erosion on his land and realised that huge periods of time were required for these sediments to be buried, metamorphosed, tilted, lifted up, eroded and then to have more rocks redeposited on top of them. And so then he started to realise that, that the age of the earth must be much, much older than we previously suspected. And the actual unconformities here on the top of the outcrop, not underneath, this is an ancient soil surface where the schist, which is these dark squiggly lines, was getting eroded and infilled by these younger sediments, which we think are carboniferous in age. And even on a conservative estimate, that means there's about 300 million years missing between the initial deposition of the Dalradian and the deposition of the Carboniferous overlying it. And that's equivalent to the gap in time between us and the start of the Permian period. On top of the unconformity, we've got another gravel bed, which is a lag surface. So what we've probably had here is the early part of a transgression. And that's quite common for unconformities because we've had a relative rise in sea level and the sea is eroding away the land surface. So there you go, that's the second part of the Lagan Loop. I hope you've enjoyed learning about the Permian sediments and Hutton's unconformity on the north of Aaron. You can check out the links to see the first part and the other videos from the Aaron series. As always, if you've got any questions, leave them in the comments below. Put them in the community tab or with any pictures of cool rocks you've seen. If you've got any requests for videos, let me know as well. Until next time, take care and I'll see you later, rock nerds. 
Bye. <laughs> Please enjoy these slow motion waves for a few minutes. How relaxing. Hmm. Geology is really cool. Let's go lick some rocks and sing tune.